Welcome. Again, I didn't see any movement in the hall, so I will not reintroduce myself because nobody budged, so thank you for that. And now we're going to go into uh, the second half of novel therapies. Okay. Um, so I kind of hated putting this slide in, but I did anyway because I needed some moment of separation. Older and or unfit has to be the longest and most hotly debated and perhaps somewhat boring, actually, conversation in AML, because I still can't define older. I used to laugh that it used to be 10 years above the age of the most senior attending in the group. I'm completely dissatisfied with that right now. It needs to be 40 years above the age of the oldest attending in the group, because that's actually me now, and I don't... I don't like that, so I don't know what older means, and I actually am not sure what unfit means either, but conceptually, the, the combinations that I'm talking about are the ones for patients who, for whatever reason, either by advanced age or by overall performance status, you're looking at them and saying, this patient cannot tolerate intensive chemotherapy with potentially a month in the hospital. So moving on to newbies, glasdegib. So glasdegib plus low-dose cytarabine in older patients with AML resulted in a survival benefit. Low-dose cytarabine has been a backbone regimen for decades in patients unable to receive intensive chemotherapy, and nobody likes it very much. It was always much more popular in, the, in Europe than in the United States. We use it because we had it, but it was never giving much of a CR rate, especially for patients with unfavorable biology. But nonetheless, we wanted to try something for patients who couldn't get intensive chemotherapy, and there was always a survival benefit and a CR benefit above doing nothing for older patients. Glasdegib is an interesting drug. It's an inhibitor of the hedgehog signaling pathway, which is generally silenced in adults, but actually abnormal signaling and overexpression have been seen in hemalignancies. And it's an important drug, actually, in leukemia stem cell survival and expansion. And maybe many of the uh, stem cell biology people are quite interested in this um, activity of, uh, of the drug. Um, of glasdegib. So inhibition of the hedgehog uh, pathway, which is what glasdegib does, may enhance chemosensitivity and actually resulted in a CR rate of 17% versus 2% in, um, in the combination versus low-dose cytarabine alone, and this got improved. So anything that is an incremental benefit over baseline regimens um, is valuable and certainly makes us think about, well, where else could this be used? How else could be it be added? On that theme, what else can we add to baseline regimens, low-dose cytarabine, hypomethylating agents, things that have been used typically for non-intensively treated AML patients, came venetoclax. So venetoclax is prominently featured in the rest of this meeting in the CLL section. It is well known as a selective inhibitor of BCL2, and basically it allows cells to uh, kind of sequester their pro-apoptotic proteins. BCL2 is anti-apoptotic, and in AML, um, the idea is that there is selective binding to BCL2, which frees these internally captured pro-apoptotic proteins and results in um, cell death. So the concept here was venetoclax was succeeding incredibly well in CLL. What, could, what action could we get in the land of AML? And as a single agent, it wasn't doing very much, and the data did not look particularly promising, but the scientific rationale was very strong, and the preliminary clinical trial in combination with azacitidine and discitabine were pushed along and have resulted in these recently published data showing actually that in combination with azacitidine and discitabine, what we are seeing is quite remarkable median overall survivals of beyond a year in older patients with newly diagnosed AML. So stepping back, what did I just say about low-dose cytarabine? Low-dose cytarabine and azacitidine and discitabine being as single agents were what we have been using as backbone regimens for patients who were not fit for intensive chemotherapy, primarily older patients. But those agents never resulted in compelling CR rates um, as a single agent, and typically the overall survival was not even approaching one year, let alone beyond. These data are not randomized data. We are still waiting for the results of the randomized trial of venetoclax in combination with azacitidine versus azacitidine alone, and those are eagerly anticipated. But certainly this type of response pattern has resulted in um, 
in outcomes for older patients with AML that we haven't seen before. Certainly nothing that I've seen um, in my now pretty long career. What's more is that, again, these are not randomized data and they are subgroups, but what we started seeing actually was that there were response rates in subgroups of older patients where typically responses were extremely difficult to get older patients, complex cytogenetics. If you look here, and if you look at yellow is CRI, green is CR, and then um, uh, marrow leukemia-free status, the, the um, uh, light blue, what you're seeing on the top is aggregated responses in groups of patients, again, where we haven't typically seen responses. So this feels very interesting. I repeat the caveat that they're not randomized data and that these are small numbers of patients, but we haven't had this before, and we've been pretty starved in the AML community treating older patients with very weak weapons, this has felt like a stronger one. Furthermore, again, small data, but preliminary. These were presented by Courtney DiNardo from MD Anderson at ASCO in 2018. Preliminary data suggesting that actually we could get quote unquote deep or MRD negative responses in these older patients. This hadn't even been something that we were really thinking would be possible with lower intensity hypomethylating agent or low dose cytarabine regimens. So the concept here was, are we dealing with something fundamentally different in this combination? in that there are higher response rates in difficult to treat patients with the potential for MRD negativity. All of these were different from what we had seen with low-dose cytarabine alone or with HMAs alone. If you look here, these are published in um, in uh, JCO, looking at venetoclax with low-dose cytarabine, again, our standard um, baseline. Here, too, CR rates and response rates, CRs in blue, CRIs are in orange that are much higher than what we would um, expect with uh, cytarabine alone. You can think back of the data that I showed you on the first slide. Generally hard to get a CR at all, let alone in patients with intermediate or poor cytogenetics. Now here, the difference here to look at is that these patients on this trial actually could have been treated with a prior hypomethylating agent. If you have had 19 cycles of a, prior, of a hypomethylating agent for MDS or prior to your diagnosis of AML, no matter what you get, it is more difficult to get a response and the outcomes are worse, whether it's CPX351 or whether it's venetoclax combinations. If you've had a lot of HMA before, it's not good news. On the decitabine and azacitidine trial that I showed you before, those patients had not received treatment with a hypomethylating agent prior to exposure to venetoclax. Here they had, and the question is that first of all, might you consider a low-dose cytarabine combination in your patients who've had a lot of HMA before? And secondly, if you take out that group, the responses look quite similar to those with HMAs, suggesting again that putting in those biologically worse behaving patients is what drop down the overall response rate for the combination with low-dose cytarabine. So this is, people should be already exploding with questions, well, now what do I do? So I could use decitabine, I could use azacitidine, I can use low-dose cytarabine. How could I possibly make this decision when treating a patient? So this slide, as I was making this, I can do an entire talk, probably for two hours on this slide. I won't, don't be scared. But there are a lot of questions that my last several slides bring up. So venetoclax, CLL, you've got to escalate. There's tumor lysis. You've got to check labs every day. How do you do that in AML? Which partner am I going to pick for a patient? Do I have a rationale to pick aza versus decitabine versus low-dose cytarabine? What about that teeny tiny small group of patients who got 10 days of decitabine at MD Anderson with venetoclax that had a 100% response rate? It's a really tiny group of patients, but we get awfully excited by, the, the, by a three-digit response of 100. Never see that in AML. How do you decide? What if the patient has a TP53? Are you going to use decitabine? Cytabine, or are you going to use aza or low-dose cytarabine? How many days of venetoclax are you going to give? How are you going to give antifungals, since there are well-known interactions with antifungals and with other medications, for example, carvedilol? Who knew? Had a patient on that have to adjust the venetoclax? At what point are you going to look at the response? Is the day 14 marrow meaningful? Day 28, day 47, what are, what, when are you gonna look to see if your patient is responding? How do you manage the myelosuppression on this regimen, which is significant? 
And what about ongoing maintenance cycles? Ooh, maintenance, I just told you something about in the la that in the last session. Well, what does that mean here? Do you keep going on and on? And then I thought about answering all these for you, but I figured I'd just have you refer me the patients instead. It's probably faster. But I think that these are actually day-to-day -day difficult questions, and there are not actually data-driven answers to most of them, because we don't have enough patients. We don't have 14 different random of the trials, but I bring these to your attention because it's a very strong regimen that looks different from others that we've had, which we are using a lot, but you've got to know what you're doing to use it, and these are just some of the clinical questions that should give pause before launching a patient um, with newly diagnosed AML into this combination, and I think my colleagues in the debate will talk a little bit further about at least some of these questions. Okay, moving into the land of relapsed AML. So relapsed AML patients are in trouble. This is still a very difficult to uh, treat disease and most of the patients die within a year after their uh, relapsed or refractory disease. There are various studies of intensive chemotherapy which have not looked good. There are three to four months survival and then the hypomethylating agents actually might look a little bit better than the intensive chemotherapy, not because they're resulting in higher response response rates, but probably because they have less toxicity and the patients are able to sustain treatment for a longer period of time. Still, a dangerous disease with bad outcomes. We do have gemtuzumab, which is approved for relapsed refractory AML, and there, this is in a, it's a small group of patients. There is a CR rate, but basically we need more in this group. So what do we do for these patients? So targeted therapy is here. You do want to check again for mutations. Now, this is a point that always gives a lot of controversy, especially in international meetings, because although the world is shifting a bit, and I think there are a lot of changes that are positive between last year and this year, it is still problematic for many sites to get mutational testing at all, let alone to repeat it at the time of relapse. Nonetheless, when at all possible, refer, send, see if you can make a deal with the lab, you want to try to check the mutational profile of your relapse patients to see if any of the novel therapies might help. One of the important groups is um, linked to a very um, frightening uh, bad memory slide from organic chemistry. So DNA methylation is linked to citrate metabolism via isocitrate dehydrogenase. So here the idea is that um, and you can possibly see some of this and possibly remember some of it from your, uh, from your old classes. But basically, what we know is that when you have IDH mutations, this results in um, the production of an oncometabolite called 2-hydroxyglutarate. And this messes up a lot of the pathways that are um, epigenetically driven differentiation. There, are, there is competition for the um, alpha-ketoglutarate-dependent enzymes, and 2-HG is driving, basically, the oncometabolite that drives the abnormal processes, cellular processes of the IDH mutant AMLs. And IDH1 and IDH2 are mutated in AML. They are rare in the 10 to 12 percent range, but we still find them. And this resulted in, um, so a couple of very important trials, looking at enacidinib, which is um, a potent uh, inhibitor of IDH2. If you look at this phase 1-2 study de design, this took a a bunch of patients with advanced heme malignancies um, giving continuous cycles of an oral drug, relapse refractory, newly diagnosed. We tried to get everybody with an IDH2 mutation onto one of the arms of this trial, and it was 100 milligrams given daily. And if you look at the endpoints, it was, again, uh, safety, tolerability, and these are um, wrapped into these two kind of um, outcome shots that the efficacy showed. This is single agent efficacy with an oral agent. Overall response rates of 40%, CR of 20%, uh, medium response duration, 5.8 months. Um, and if you look at the overall survival in patients who are responding, long overall survival of well over a year in patients who are responding. So this was a very interesting finding, clearly an example of molecularly targeted therapy. For those of us who have had the pleasure of having patients respond to this drug, it's extraordinary when they do respond. Um, I have had, actually, on this trial,
trial a newly diagnosed patient respond without ever being in the hospital, and it is, um, it is quite powerful. You do need to be aware of the um, specific side effects of differentiation syndrome. There's also some indirect hyperbilirubinemia, which should not make you stop the drug. So there are side effect profiles for the inhibitors that are a little bit different from um, other therapies. But this, of course, bro uh, brought forward the immediate question of, well, if we have intensive chemotherapy combined with a FLT3 inhibitor for FLT3 mutated AML, what about IDH inhibitors in combination with intensive therapy? And that is being investigated. So the goal is always to try to drop your best weapons on the initial diagnosis and try to whittle away at the number of patients who ultimately relapse. Nonetheless, this is a, um, an important drug for patients um, with relapse disease, and those with the mutation should be strongly considered for it. Now, in a parallel trial of ivocytinib, which is a drug for um, IDH1 mutated AML. This, again, multiple subgroups that allowed patients with relapse disease, with untreated disease, all to be um, participating in, uh, in this trial. And these um, had very, very similar types of in, uh, impressive single agent results with an overall response rate of um, 40%, six month duration, CR rates of 20%, and again, a long median survival in patients with CR. So the question here is that, um, Again, powerful mutationally directed therapy in the relapse setting. Does this get you to an allo transplant in some patients with relapse disease? Maybe. Is there a prolonged survival beyond what we would expect with intensive chemotherapy? For sure, for those patients with the mutation. And again, what's going to be the outcome with combinations? Do you combine these drugs with venetoclax, with azacitidine, with a standard chemotherapy? All of these combination trials are underway. The fact that there are lots of potential combinations is exciting, but also makes it difficult for clinicians to decide what to do. And the general message of the day is don't just start combining lots of different drugs because it can be hazardous uh, both to your health and the patients. If you look specifically here for ivocytinib, again, looking at differentiation syndrome and here a little bit of QT prolongation, these medications do have individual side effect profiles, venetoclax myelosuppression, the IDH inhibitor with differentiation syndrome, one has to be quite careful in mixing everything together. That said, all of them can be managed very successfully. They are overall quite well tolerated, and I think there is an incredible opportunity for combination therapy that is evolving, and hopefully in the context of clinical trials. Now here, I got to present these data at ASH, actually. Um, which were fun last year. Um, so I love swimmers' plots, especially when some of mine are the longest and fastest swimmers. And here the idea is to, um, to just show the small cohort of patients, of 33 patients, with untreated AML who were not able to get intensive therapies and who were able to get onto ivocytinib um, as their initial treatment. And this actually has resulted in a label change for ivocytinib, which is currently available for IDH1 mutated patients with newly diagnosed disease based on, um, based on these data. So if you move to um, the FLT3 inhibitors for relapse, so the development of FLT3 inhibitors has been in relapse disease with second generation, highly potent and selective FLT3 inhibitors. Both gilteritinib and quizartinib beat salvage chemotherapy in uh, phase three trials of relapse and refractory AML. Gilteritinib is FDA approved already. Quizartinib is approved in Japan. They didn't get through ODAC for relapse disease, but we are waiting for the upfront combination data with quizartinib in newly diagnosed patients. And again, here, these, um, these drugs are much more selective than mitostorin. I think the word selective often implies better. I don't think that that's a synonym. They act differently. They are very potent. We do expect that the upfront data are going to look compelling um, with uh, both gilteritinib and with quizartinib, but those data don't exist yet. So currently, um, we get a, uh, about a 20% CR rate with gilteritinib, and the goal is actually that this would be um, allowing some patients to move on to um, allo stem cell transplant. The other thing to keep in mind with all of the inhibitors, and I keep ending sessions on the topic of maintenance, but the reason that we've been allo transplanting 
everybody with AML who we possibly can is because there haven't been therapies to date that one could be giving the patients on an ongoing basis with improvements in overall survival. So the question is, with the addition of inhibitors, FLT3 inhibitors, IDH inhibitors, with the potential um, of oral azacitidine, might there be ways that at least selected patients could be maintained on oral relatively well uh, tolerated therapies without going on to allo transplant? Hypothetical question, uh, food for thought. And here's my favorite slide again, and that is with eight whole seconds to spare. <laughs>